Yuri Soloveitchik, I'm a program director at RPE, and I will talk about uh, a program which is at very early stage, which may happen, maybe not, and if it will happen, uh, I think it will happen with your help, of course. So I will talk about next generation of fuel cell. In next few minutes, I will explain why I see them as a fast, furious, and flexible. And based on the title in this picture, you probably already made a guess uh, that I will be talking about fuel cells specifically designed for mobile trans application and for transportation sector. Uh, we already heard a lot uh, that transportation sector is responsible for about a third of all energy consumed and all, a third of all emissions are emitted uh, from energy sector. And uh, we have several options for that. We can use biofuels, we can use synthetic motor fuel, but the most attractive option is electrification of transportation. And why it happened, it happening and why it will happen. First of all, economics. We need to reduce our oil imports. Uh, we definitely need to increase the efficiency of transportation. Uh, we have to decarbonize transportation. It's notoriously hard to do. Uh, especially when you do like heavy duty idling uh, long term. So definitely we need to reduce these emissions. With uh, all this uh, connectivity of uh, automobiles, uh, we need more computing power for entertainment, for navigation, for autonomous driving at least. Uh, for military application, we are looking at lower noise, which is also important for uh, our, our common life and the low thermal signature. And frankly, our electric cars are actually fun to drive. And you can see from this picture, I'm driving a Tesla, okay? So, in this slide you can see two flagships of uh, electrified vehicles. You can use a battery car like Tesla, 85 kilowatt hour battery, uh, range like more than 260 miles. Or you can use uh, Toyota Mirai, which is uh, 113 kilowatt power fuel cell and range more than 300 miles. And both these vectors have their own strengths and own weaknesses. Uh, for example, uh, batteries are, they can provide very high power, nice acceleration. Uh, they have high round trip efficiency, of course. Or uh, if you look at uh, Weaknesses, uh, there are also plenty. So you have, still have a limited range, uh, the recharging time is an issue. Uh, lithium battery safety still is a question. Or, and of course, battery cost. When you look at fuel cell cars, definitely they have high energy density. They can provide uh, long range transportation. Uh, they can provide heavy duty transportation, which battery cannot. Uh, Charging time is comparable with our regular gasoline charging time. No, but uh, the infrastructure for hydrogen is not existing and it's very hard to implement. Uh, definitely less mature technology compared to battery or uh, lower round trip efficiency if you look at uh, the efficiency of the fuel cell itself. And of course, fuel cell cost. Okay, so in people who uh, working on uh, electric battery electric vehicles, uh, they're trying to increase the size of battery, which increases weight, increases the cost, and eventually we cannot uh, avoid uh, this range anxiety completely or charging time issue. For fuel cell cars, we need to build a nice uh, uh, fuel cell stack, and actually DOE invested uh, a lot of money in, in this work and developed a very good cost structure already, like $50 uh, per kilowatt. Uh, but hydrogen infrastructure is not existing. And if you look at uh, these two options, battery is over-designed for energy. So we pay for that. Or when you look at fuel cell cars, they definitely over-designed for power, and we pay for that. So what would be the other option? I propose a solution which is hybridization uh, with direct liquid fuel cells. So we can combine plug-in electric vehicles uh, with fuel cell range extender. And I think it's for it probably a good option which can be used both for light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, 
in this case, like if you look at this picture, we can uh, get uh, like 10 to 20 kilowatt hour battery, uh, which can deliver very high power for acceleration, for generative braking. Uh, provide, and we can use uh, a small stack, like five to 20 kilowatt uh, power uh, stack, which can provide just a charge in this battery on the all her way. And uh, the third uh, very important stuff, we, uh, we would like to use liquid sustainable fuels. Uh, we don't need to build a new infrastructure like we have to do for hydrogen because uh, liquid fuel infrastructure already exists. So what we can do, this is why uh, we have critical three needs. It should be fast. Uh, we need to run this uh, startup time very quick. And right now, if you look at uh, solar dioxide fuel cells, they require several hours to be heated to working temperature. PM is great, but PM can work only with hydrogen. So the infrastructure issue was still there. We talk about furious, so they have to deliver indeed high power to be uh, small enough and put under the hood with, with a small battery. And it should be flexible. Uh, they should be capable to use a variety of sustainable fuels. And uh, on the next slide, uh, I can show you some examples of what fuels can be. So it can be, say, methanol or dimethyl ether, it may be ammonia. And you can see that if you use just standard size or uh, liquid fuel tank, we can get a range extender like up to 700 miles. Or, or if you have a much smaller tank or using just exclusive for range extender, it's still, we are talking about 300 miles easily. Uh, and if you look at the, the competitive hydrogen option, even with liquid hydrogen, we have pretty small range. And compression uh, hydrogen at 700 bar, even less. So you will ask why uh, BRI has actually 300 miles, because they have actually uh, total uh, volume of this tank is not 16 gallon, but 32 gallon. Okay, and we already have some trailblazers who are going this path. So we have uh, Diazo developed uh, a hydrazine fuel, a small car. Uh, we have uh, uh, Nissan having a program and actually a car on the road uh, which runs uh, on ethanol uh, range extender. We have APUs designed for uh, heavy duty trucks uh, by Delphi and by European consortium. And believe it or not, but uh, APU running on methanol or 250 kilowatt uh, stack is uh, actually powering uh, uh, this big ship and can be done in air as well. So, and we have definitely do some component requirements. We need to get better catalysts, better membrane, but more even important, we have to get a better stack. N nice design. We can do one small stack a small cell heated in a second, but uh, we have to design a stack which will do it in a minutes. And if you look at the application, there are plenty of them. We'll go from unmanned vehicles to APUs uh, to planes, and finally to our transportation sector, both uh, light duty and heavy duty. And I'll finish with the quote of the day. Adam Heller said that on historical scale, like 100 years, there is no question in my mind that we will drive liquid fuel based fuel cell power cars. And my answer is let's make it 10 years, guys, and I need your help. Thank you. Uh, and now let me introduce uh, our fellow Fadl Tsadi. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fadl Nan Hu. One second. And I am the latest fellow, so I just joined about a month ago. And one of the nice things about being a fellow at RPAE that I thought was really cool was it gives you the opportunity to look and explore in totally new spaces that aren't your domains of expertise. So even though my PhD is on photoelectrochemistry, what I want to talk to you guys about today are smarter structures, about envisioning integrated systems that synchronize building envelope technologies. So we use approximately 13 quads of energy to heat and cool structures 
every year in the United States. And that translates to about 13% of total domestic consumption. In cities like the one I'm showing here, Cleveland, Ohio, where I was born, go Cavs, uh, over 50% of all energy consumption on the residential basis is due to heating and cooling. Now we don't always notice it, but we modify building envelopes all the time. We open doors and windows to allow air to pass through and cool down a structure. We raise blinds to allow solar gains to stream in and warm them up. If you're anything like me, you also probably use your HVAC system a little bit too much to optimize the temperature in your building so that it is exactly what you want it to be. But what we rarely do is automate and integrate these components. What I'm showing here are two towers near where my parents currently live in Abu Dhabi, and these towers are really cool. What they're able to do is that they have smart metal blinds on the outside, which are coupled with solar sensors and the HVAC system to make sure that these structures get the most amount of sunlight in for the lowest HVAC consumption possible. So these structures are 35% more efficient than a comparable structure is in Abu Dhabi. Unfortunately, they're not cheap. These structures also cost twice as much as a comparable one would. So what I'm interested in are new technologies that you could integrate together that have the potential to be cheap, that can give you a truly dynamic structure. And the reason I'm interested in these dynamic structures is because they have the potential to be a lot more energy efficient than a static one could be. With some estimates, estimating it to be about 60% more energy efficient than even the most energy efficient static structure. There are a lot of different envelope technologies that can manipulate energy flow, but I've categorized them under four broad categories. The first are technologies that allow you to modulate the amount of sunlight coming in and out of your structure. So you can think of things like electrochromic, gasochromic, smart blinds, or even smart mirrors that allow you to reflect light away from the structure. I'm showing here windows from a Boeing 737, one of the newer ones that have electrochromic windows. And these are really nice because every passenger is able to modulate the amount of sunlight entering their window. But if need be, the flight attendants can control all of them at once so that one person that wants to read the newspaper in the middle of that long haul flight doesn't disturb everyone else. We also have thermal storage technologies. So anything from rather simple, sensible heat systems to more complex phase change materials that store energy in the form of latent heat or even reversible thermochemical systems that store energy in the form of chemical bonds. We also have the ability to modify and modulate the heat flux in and out of a building with technologies such as wall slots and modifying the pressure in between wall panels. We're still gonna have our ventilation system that's going to be able to work in concert with the rest of these technologies. And we're of course gonna need to be able to control these systems. So we're gonna need to know the climate not just inside the structure but also outside the structure and the status of all these different technologies at once. So here are a couple of examples of recent systems integration. The first is by a San Gobain subsidiary, GlassX, and here they've coupled transparency and thermal storage. So they have these windows where light goes through first a prismatic filter that only allows light from certain angles to, from certain angles to pass through and then it passes through an inorganic phase change material that is transparent to visible light, which stores enough heat that these act similar to a 10 inch concrete wall, which is really exciting if you're like me and you like staring outside of windows or staring at 10 inches of concrete, right? This is another example by Rubitherm, which has integrated phase change materials directly into their ventilation system this is a pilot that they're currently running, trying to see if they can get rid of all external cooling and rely simply on these phase change materials in the ventilation sh um, shaft. But they've already shown cooling capabilities of about 15 to 30 watts per meter squared at room temperature. 
So what I'm interested in and what I want to make sure we do is that we don't optimize all of these different technologies siloed from one another, but instead truly envision an integrated system that's optimized on a systems level. But for that to happen, a few difficult questions have to be answered. And the nice thing about being an ARPA-E fellow is I can ask you for your thoughts on these questions. So the first is, which technologies are best suited for something like this? I already mentioned a litany of different technologies, but which ones do you think are best suited? What response times are necessary? Do these structures need to be dynamic on a second by second basis, or is it okay if they're on a minute by minute or even hour by hour time scale? And relatedly, what kind of control systems do we need? What kind of sensors are necessary for us to reach a vision like this? So I would love to hear your thoughts on these questions. And I've left my name and email on there. Come find me afterwards if you wanna talk or shoot me an email. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Thank you so much. And now I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Ohari, who is a program director at RPE. Latest program director. Latest right. program director. So, um, wait for the slide to come. What I'd like to propose today is the next generation energy cycles, modular power, that will introduce a paradigm shift in terms of how we do the business with the objective of substantially higher energy efficiency, less complex, maybe a lot less complex, and substantially smaller in size. As I look around the room, I see process identification, chemical engineers, I see CFD, I see material science, I see thermofluidics, and I see computational fluid mechanics. I'm betting that we need contribution of all of these disciplines and it's the one field that could bring all of this together. I have here process identification. It is a field that I truly believe in. And the way I define process identification is a situation, an environment that you provide for the working fluid, such that every molecule of the working fluid would be contributing to the process. So what that means, if you are designing a heat transfer surface, you have to equally be careful about how you distribute the flow how you bring the flow in, how we glide it over the surface, and how you get it out. How much smaller? I'm not sure if any of you, hopefully many of you, stopped by General Electric booth downstairs where they were showing a 14 megawatt turbine right sitting on the bench, less than two feet in length, less than one foot in height. And this has been done. And if you ask them, the efficiency is north of 50%. What would that mean? You will see later on, this is substantial. This is substantial. I'm showing here some of the work that automotive industry has been able to do and um, with steam ranking cycles. If you transfer to a working fluid like supercritical CO2, all of a sudden you could substantially reduce the size of the system. Yes, this one also has been done, very compressor and turbine coaxial could fit in your palm for 50 kilowatts. All right, so what are some of the things that we can do in terms of um, making this happen? Some quick review of fundamentals in terms of why higher temperatures. I think higher temperatures would mean higher efficiency for the cycles. Carnot principle, if you like that. If otherwise, many other studies will show you that. Why higher pressures? Higher pressures would provide a situation where you could use supercritical fluids, therefore you could reduce the size of the system. So the next slide is basically showing how higher temperatures can affect your cycle. Um, Dr. Addison Stark mentioned cycles that could approach adiabatic flame temperature. To the left, I'm showing some material limitations. To the right, I'm showing some power cycle efficiencies. And Dr. David, too, mentioned his integration synergy and the fact that today power cycles are at about 30-somewhat percent can be substantially increased that. 
I'm not suggesting that overnight from four to 500 degrees C, we jump into 3,500 degrees C. I think if you did that, you would be asking industry to change infrastructure altogether and rest assured they are not ready to do that. But what we are suggesting is can we do power cycles that somebody can use that can be go at RPOE projects and would shift today's four to 500 degrees C, maybe eight to 900 to 1,000 degrees C. But again, if it works, be something that it matters. Um, why higher pressures? We argue by higher temperatures. Higher pressures to the left and the right is comparing a steam ranking cycle versus a supercritical CO2. When you look at the chart, the low side pressure in the condenser could be 10 kPa. The high side pressure in the turbine could be 10 MPa, right? Or one MPa, no matter what, the pressure ratio between these two is much larger than 100, right? But look to the right and you see a supercritical CO2 cycle and the high side the pressure is 250 bars, 240 bars like the General Electric module. On the low side, 80 bars, divide the two by each other, you're talking about ratio about three. What would that mean? That means now you no longer need so many stages of turbine to bring the pressure ratio down. That is where your compaction is coming from but what you had to do is to use a new working fluid that would take those. So what else did you just realize? As you can see in here, you shifted a two-phase flow into a single flow cycle. Now you have supercritical CO2 that is going through the cycle. You have single phase heat exchangers. You have a more stable system. You do not have the uncertainty that goes with two-phase flow. After 40 years, we still do not understand two-phase flow inside tubes or outside tubes. If anybody convinced you that we do, we do not. Maybe we understand boiling on top of a flat surface, maybe a roughened surface. The moment we go working fluids inside the two-phase flow, we do not have a good understanding. Single-phase flow, we do, much better. All right, you say, look, um, General Electric showed the 14 megawatt on top of a table. Is there anything left for me to do? I did ask this question at the booth yesterday from General Electric people. And they shared with me what I really had thought that is a realistic assessment of the situation. There's plenty to do. There is plenty to do. We need materials that could work at these temperatures. Naturally, industry may be doing some research that is towards product development. Universities can come together with industry to improve these models. We need CFT for better predictions. We need better heat exchangers for Addison Star, for David II, for every program. And on top of that, we need CFTs, we need process intensification. And if you were to repeat the designs, it would not work. You have to come up with innovative designs, innovative materials, and innovative manufacturing process. But we are living in an era where you are having machine learning, automation, you have global communication, remote sensing, and you have a situation where materials are changing face and they're coming to a new era of uh, realization. So with that, um, I do not want you to think that this is limited to power cycles. There are many other fields that can benefit. If you're impressed with the process intensification that macro channels offer compared to very big tubes, go and look at the mass transfer and you will find out that through macro structures you could reduce the size of the systems two to four order of magnitude. Okay, so you could have better combustion, you could have better food. We do not have valves that would take high temperatures. We do not have good pumps. We do not have good pipes. This is a field that is 50 years old. So you feel like at least 50 years old. So plenty of opportunity in those fields. I'm showing here oil and gas application, the gas flaring. You may have read in North Dakota alone, 20% of the gas produced is flared. And if you go around the country and you go around the globe, this is billions of billions that is being wasted. Why? Because we do not have capacity of a gas to liquid facility to convert this gas into liquid. But if I could develop macro GTLs where I could change that gas into liquid and then pump it or store it, that itself is a big area. Then on the right bottom corner, I'm showing application for waste recovery, collecting some dollars from the trucks, from the airplanes, from um, petrochemical plants, separation processes, and so forth. So with that, I hope you're excited to give us your comments. 
and how we could uh, together define a program on this. I hope to be um, having a workshop sometimes in summer. Thank you very much. From Mike to another Mike. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, we uh, truly live in a worldwide wireless web. I've intentionally added a W there. Uh, just one statistic, uh, in 2014, e-commerce, wireless e-commerce exceeded 50% of all e-commerce. The wireless growth, wireless communication growth is also driven by the so-called Internet of Things, shown there by that graphic, where the projections are uh, 20 or 50 billion items connected to the internet by 2020. Pretty impressive. <clears throat> Wireless communications is, is intrinsically inefficient. And uh, I've put a provocative statement in the title, how inefficient. There was a, a green touch study done by industry, a deep dive uh, finished uh, in 2015, which highlighted this inefficiency, but even claimed that there might be a 10,000 X opportunity question for us, though, is how much of that 10,000x do we actually need to achieve to really be transformative? So put that in, in the back of your mind. <clears throat> Pictorially shown here is, is the problem. When we communicate uh, over the internet, typically we're talking to a data center, most typically, that might be hundreds or even thousands of miles away. Uh, most of that link is conducted in, in a very efficient, energy efficient way over fiber. But the so-called last mile, when you receive that data uh, in your car, in your house, um, et cetera, is inefficient. And the gr graphic here is meant to show that inefficiency. Most of the energy in the wireless network is sent out into ether and never collected. So there's the intrinsic inefficiency. In fact. Pictorially, you can show that the energy per bit uh, in the last mile is much, much higher than the energy per bit in those thousands of miles of potential link. The data centers use a lot of energy, of course, but that last mile is what we're talking about today. And in fact, studies have shown, as a, in an energy per, per bit sense, that last mile is a, on a, the order of 100 times more energy efficient, inefficient, than the rest of the network. So let's put some numbers on that. This is an old number, but it's still instructive that 5% of global electricity consumed by the um, information and computing uh, uh, communications technology sector in 2012. And some estimates put that at closer to 10% already today. So it's a growing uh, energy hog, of course. Well, that's being driven to a large degree by by mobile. And in fact, and this chart shows projections of the mobile to mobile part, the green bar there, growing more than other sectors. So that's a doubling in the next few years, clearly an energy issue. But more importantly, the traffic is going to grow even by more. I'm not quite sure what's driving that. Perhaps it's anticipating, uh, you know, uh, 4K cat videos or something, but I just, it, it's hard to imagine using all of that bandwidth, but the bandwidth uh, expectations are very large. And of course, commensurate with that will be energy requirement. And you can see by this projection, mobile access networks are already on a par with the large power consuming data centers, but even more worrisome is that the growth rate is higher than that for data centers. <clears throat> so what's the opportunity here? Well, if you're familiar with, with uh, the history of, uh, of mobile phones, of course, we are now in our fourth generation, uh, so-called 4G. Um, but there is a coming next generation, fifth generation, 5G for short. And in fact, it should be deployed in the 2020s. Second bullet there is interesting. There are no, actually no standards yet. And that presents, I think, an opportunity for us to have impact in, a, in an energy sense on the deployment of 5G. Even though there's no standards, there's a lot of consensus on what's going to be needed. For instance, very high rates per user, much higher subscriber density, uh, spectral efficiency enhancements. We're going to push into the millimeter wave spectrum. That's going to have some challenges. Significantly reduced latency. <clears throat> 
I alluded to that uh, Green Touch study, and I urge you to look it up. It's a very detailed, deep dive conducted by Bell Labs and other members of industry that looked at this uh, wireless energy consumption issue. Their conclusion centered on three approaches, which I'm summarizing here as something called a small cell architecture, a signal processing opportunity, and, and beam forming. And in fact, cutting to their one of their key conclusions, depending on the scenario and the approaches you're, you're selecting, the opportunity for improved efficiency, as you can see, is on the order of 10,000 X. And um, so that's a very intriguing number. It says two things. One is, this, we know what we already know, wireless are, is very inefficient, but maybe there's a, there's a significant amount of headroom that we can exploit for, for good purposes. So let's talk about these three ideas. The small cell architecture, as the name implies, involves replacing large cell towers, which consume on the order of three kilowatts and are widely spaced on the order of a kilometer or a mile, with a bunch of smaller ones in certain scenarios. A little bit of rudimentary analysis, which I won't go through on the bottom, but shows that under some scenarios, you can actually get a net power e efficiency improvement by going to the small cell type of architecture. In addition, you can exploit things like using intel intelligent sleep modes and you can actually separate the signaling and data functions in your network, which is also an, a path to higher efficiency. <clears throat> in the signal processing domain, it's really about exploiting the fundamental trade-off between energy efficiency, measured in bits per second per watt, and spectral efficiency, measured in bits per second per hertz. You can imagine in the power-limited region, that would be maybe uh, suburban or rural areas where you really got to get the energy uh, to, to the source and, uh, and to, to the receiver, whereas in the bandwidth limited region, say urban, where you have not so long distances, but you really want to use all the bandwidth effectively that you can. So there are ideas on how to do that, involving, for instance, single user and multi-user MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple output, coordinated multi-point transmissions, and something called interference alignment, and, and, and other ideas. So there are signal processing opportunities as well. In the, in the third idea suggested by Green Touch antenna beam, is antenna beam forming, where you can replace these uh, omnidirectional large antennas with multiple small antennas, and it, with the right control, you can direct the energy uh, in a more effective way. So you can have much smaller physically ante physical antennas, low power, individually controlled, of course requiring sophisticated control to do that, but the idea is to deliver user selective data beams in an efficient way. So you can see from what I've just described, many very interesting technical questions arise. In, in fact, many. I'm just going to list a few here. How should the small cell architecture be configured, for instance? How should we best exploit the diversity we can get with uh, antennas and signal processing? Um, are there other strategies beyond these three? Think about that. Are there other strategies that remain unexplored? What are the challenges and benefits of going to the millimeter wave or greater than 20 gigahertz spectrum in the 5G deployment? Can we, can we do something very energy efficient there? Can RF energy harvesting help? Is there, uh, how do we look at the energy efficiency versus cost of deployment trade-off? That's always a, an issue. And many others, literally pages of questions. But here's, here's where you come in, and what we do at RPE is, is critical. We take these interesting questions, all of them interesting, but which ones, if answered, could be transformative? And that's where you guys come in. Please, please help us. This is a very early stage uh, discussion. We anticipate a, a workshop or an RFI this year, but please come and talk to us or send us your ideas, and we look forward to talking with you about them. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jeff Short and Gino Serpa who helped with this presentation. I thank them and I thank you for your attention. So that brings us to the Q&A session, section and I can see that we have some questions appearing. So we will take them in order and do as many as we can. So this is a, the first question is for Grigori. <clears throat> is high power density, fast start, and direct liquid fuels one to two mir miracles too many? What are the new ideas? Okay, uh, actually I was anticipating the question like, what are you smoking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But basically, we uh, do have some ideas. Uh, as I said, uh, I've seen examples when a single cell can, solid oxide fuel cell can be heated uh, in a second or uh, in many times without any deterioration of performance. The bigger task is engineering, how we can deliver uniform heating or, or heat transfer, actually, because we will need probably to remove heat during the operation as well. So, and how we can make, say, cell symmetrical enough to reduce this uh, heat uh, damage. From other side, uh, can we design a catalyst which uh, can work with the sustainable fuels like alcohols or ammonia in a such way to reduce our thermal requirements and kind of to ease the task of engineers to design the stack. I think it's possible, but there is indeed two major challenges or as I kind of try to outline. Thanks. <coughs> Question for Fadl. Would buildings operate independently or is communication between them important? That's a good question. Um, I think the current way I'm framing it, these buildings are siloed from one another. I think more can be gained from integrating them. That increases the complexity. I don't want to get to a point where the complexity is too vast for us to be able to answer it. So for now, I'm thinking about them independent of one another, but I think in the future, we will need to think of them connected to the grid, connected to one another, and communicating with one another. Thank you. Question for Mike. Is it a good idea to use supercritical CO2 power cycle for low temperature range power generation, for example, around 200 C? Well, we would uh, welcome innovations. Um, I'll show you the cycle um, where you're, you're limited to the lower side of the temperature and pressure for supercritical CO2 and you're limited to the higher side. So if you come up with a way that you could challenge this cycle, um, that is, Welcome to be discussed. Thank you. Another question for Fadl. What acceptable payback period are you considering for the building technologies being evaluated? So I think one of the interesting things right now, and I'm new to this field, so you, um, this is so I, I immediately felt this, is when it comes to these dynamic technologies, getting the answers for whether or not these would be worth it or payback periods isn't, it, we're not even close to being there right now on terms of the models currently existing and, and what we know. My hunch is that anything over five years is probably going to be too long, um, but, but for now we're just, more so than thinking about the payback period of each individual one, having the ability to diagnose and assess these technologies is something I think we critically need. Great. <clears throat> Another question for Grigori. Can you address the operating temperature of the fuel cells? Can you achieve high enough temperature to utilize other fuel sources? Um, actually, uh, when I was thinking about that, sir, we need to heat up our cell to temperature pretty high to be effective for, for the liquid fuels because it's not hydrogen. We probably have to do internal reforming. Uh, how we can do it, we can use the same fuel just to combust a part of this fuel uh, to actually heat the system or we can use electrical heater uh, incorporated in a, in a stack design. There are two major ways, both have pluses and minuses. I guess sir, we will explore both. Very good. And also for Gregory, um, what sort of greenhouse emissions can be expected from fuel cells powered by hydrocarbons like gasoline? So I guess it's a greenhouse gas question. Our greenhouse, of course, if you're talking about carbonational fuels like alcohols, we still have CO2 emissions. Uh, but we plan to produce this fuel sustainably from CO2. If you're talking about ammonia, which is probably one of my favorites, uh, there is no CO2 emissions whatsoever, uh, unless we will emit it during the production, which I also try to avoid uh, uh, in uh, my refuel program. Okay, here's a question for me. Energy use by wireless is small, less than 1% global energy end use. 
if you make it more efficient, will it matter? Which is the question we always ask at RPE. Well, I would argue, I think, that it is, it is small now but growing, which is a key point. And it, if you remember the chart, it's growing at a, at a high rate. It seems an insatiable need for wireless connectivity. And I guess I would argue that even at 1%, um, if we could knock off, we, we do things 1% at a time, a few 1% and you've really hit something. So if we can make wireless power consumption in, in the noise in terms of power consumption, that would be a good thing. So that would be my answer. Let's see. Fadl, on the topic of smart buildings, how would you propose to get these technologies into existing structures? All right, so these, this is, so my talk was envisioning new buildings. Of course, most buildings in the United States aren't built every year. They're kind of old. I'm from, I've been living in Dubai for a few years and I'm not used to that. Uh, but retrofitting buildings would be even more complex, right? Because now all of a sudden, you're starting with an existing infrastructure. We have, of course, technologies that diagnose heat losses, and, and RPE is invested in some technologies that diagnose heat losses in buildings, but that, that's a further challenge. You know, at this level, at this stage, I don't, I don't have an answer for that other than hopefully whatever models that we come up with will allow you to integrate existing buildings into them and allow you to see which technologies would be most beneficial. One of the things I want to be able to see is even if a technology siloed by itself is very efficient, if it actually moves the needle for a current building that's say already integrated a smart HVAC design. So those kinds of questions are crucial and, and what I'm hoping we can get to in the future. Thank you. Mike, for high temperature fueled heat engines, are emissions a challenge? We have a closed cycle here, um, so uh, the supercritical CO2 is inside of a closed cycle, and I'm not adding anything uh, in terms of emission. However, um, you could go and calculate 1% efficiency increase, what it would do to emission reduction and what it would do to water consumption. Nobody has been talking about water. Um, water is more critical issue than uh, energy, perhaps. So I run a model, a simplified model, and I found out for every percent increase in a 1,000 megawatt power plant, for this one power plant, you will be saving 2.6 billion gallons of water per year, okay? So what we are doing here, we are talking about substantially higher energy efficiencies. Um, I might be wrong, but I think I'm pretty sure the general electric turbine and power cycle is north of 50%. So taking a gas turbine from 35%, 40% to 52%, 53%, that is phenomenal. That is not easy, but uh, I'm not also, so I'm, um, my response to the question is I will be reducing emissions because I will be substantially improving efficiency. I will be reducing thermal pollutions, I will be reducing other pollutions, other emissions. But on top of that, I would like you to think about not just power cycles, I want you to think about modular power. I want you to think about the exhaust of a gas turbine. I want to think about exhaust of a truck. If you went and captured those heat and produced power, then you could reduce emissions substantially. So we are really talking about what Mike introduced in cell phones, a paradigm shift. People are not willing to go to 1990s and carry a heavy phone in their pockets. So I'm hoping the next generation energy cycles would be such that will not be willing to go back to big power plants, requiring a boiler, requiring a condenser, requiring a river, requiring cooling towers that produce a lot of moisture. So I definitely think that I'm looking for substantially reduced emissions. Thank you. It's a question uh, for me. Uh, the question is, could ambient energy harvesting be disruptive in existing wireless networks? And I think this is a very fascinating question. Uh, we've just begun to scratch the surface, examining the literature and talking to folks. There is some research into har harvesting RF energy and using it for some RFID and other, other kinds of applications. But I think that might be a very interesting area of research and I would ask for your ideas in that regard. 
Uh, question for Grigori. Uh, don't you expect the hybrid fuel cell to be more expensive with both advanced lithium and precious electrocatalysts? That's a very good question. I think that the major advantage we can get uh, if we will not do over design, even we probably can live with the current uh, loading of PGMs are, I guess current it's low enough. Uh, but if you remember my presentation, I was talking about reducing both battery size and the stack size like five times from the maximum designed, over designed. So I, I guess cost or benefits would be there if Thank we can you. deliver performance. Thank you. All right, we'll finish with one provocative question for Mike. If, it, <laughs> if advanced power cycles are so efficient, why haven't they achieved broader market penetration yet? Excellent question. Because there has been no need for innovation, because energy prices have been cheap, because water has not been as critical as before, and because the cost has really prevented new systems. So we are now realizing, and something that to me has substantially changed in the past 10 to 15 years is advanced manufacturing. I have witnessed firsthand, we are doing designs in the heat exchanger field and the metal side that we could never do before. We are getting 10 times improvement in heat transfer performance in the first trials. So things are changing rapidly. So do not think that, th it's a very excellent question. Do we have the potential? I really think we do have the potential. Do we have the cost figures uh, different? I think if you go back for certain applications, you would find payback periods that could be um, realistic. Well, that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, we thank you for your attention and we look forward to hearing your ideas. Yeah.